Welcome to another episode of New Atlas Live. I'm Brian Berletic. Uh, joining me is Angelo Giuliano. Uh, he's based in Hong Kong. I'm based in Thailand. Uh, New Atlas Live is a little bit different from our inflection program. This is kind of a more laid back uh, discussion. We'll, we'll also take questions and answers the entire time. I just want to point out that we, we don't do super chats. We don't monetize. I don't monetize YouTube at all. I, I have turned that off. I don't even turn it on. They can't de demonetize my videos because I never monetize them in the first place. So if you want to support what I'm doing, check in the video description below. There's all kinds of uh, different ways you could do that. And also if you're just uh, sharing, that's that's great also. That greatly helps. So the, you know, one way or the other, that that's really helping. Uh, Angela, how are you doing? I'm doing great, uh, Brian. I'm glad to have those chats. You know, uh, as you said, uh, I think it's nice to have some uh, something more informal. You do, you're doing your research on your side. I'm doing mine at the same. You know, and, and I think it's nice that we have. Uh, you know, we can actually uh, condense information that we have through throughout the week, and and make it uh, something more more casual. You know, I mean, uh, the problem is that you. I mean, we've talked about this before. We we're focusing on negative stuff. I mean, we're talking about Cold War. We're talking about. You know what is happening. I mean, na nasty stuff, really, really. Uh, so I think it's it's good just we we keep it laid back, and and give the information um, to people. You know what's going on. Just a re recap. Yeah. I would say a recap of uh, what's going on. And and we have three different topics. Uh, Brian, yeah. can you tell us uh, what are the topics? So we're gonna we're gonna talk. I think we're gonna start with the Ukraine update first. We're gonna talk about the situation in Sri Lanka and also. Uh, Japan, the assassination of Shinzo Abe. We're going to talk about that and also maybe a little more recent development or a relatively recent development in Japan's stance towards Taiwan. Um, I just saw someone in the comments ask, um, they haven't heard of Angelo Giuliano. Well, Angelo is the one who actually got me into doing videos in the first place. I've been writing under a pen name for the longest time. Uh, he had been helping spread my work and uh, before I got into my doing my first videos, uh, he was the one who kind of helped encourage me, give me some pointers and help spread spread it around when it first came out, really helped establish the channel. And uh, he's uh, great at researching. Uh, we, we, we see eye to eye on a lot of topics and there's two, you know, two people can do more research than one person. So it's, it's great. Yeah. Can, can I add one more thing, Brian? Uh, I, I knew you through uh, your pen name, Tony Catalucci, already like uh, over 10 years ago. So we, we have like similar experience. You, so you've experienced a color revolution there in Thailand. Uh, I was yeah. actually in Thailand in 2009. It was 2009 or 2010. So I experienced, you know, I mean, this color revolution. And I was following you actually through your pen name, Tony Catalucci. So what you experienced back then, I experienced in Hong Kong, this proxy war. U.S. fighting China in Hong Kong, and yeah. and we see this war that happening everywhere. You know, when you look at uh, Ukraine, even Sri Lanka, somehow you know you can see the influence. But but on the background, it's a proxy war. There are proxy wars happening right now, same as they they used to happen in during the Cold War. But but here it's getting really serious. Now we have yeah. the example of Ukraine. You know, and uh, they started saying, well, this is a Ukraine Russia fight. It's not. It's a NATO fight. It's a fight for hegemony. It's a declining power which is struggling, and it doesn't want to accept that you know there's a multipolar world happening. You know, BRICS. Have you seen like BRICS? What's happening? Uh, other countries want to join. You know, it's this is the majority of people against a minority which is extremely aggressive. You know, just just because they they've been holding on to power for hundreds. In hundreds of years, and they, they don't want to accept that we are heading towards a multipolar world. And I'm very excited because, well, we, we've been living, you've been living two decades in, in Thailand, I've been living over two decades in China. And I think, I think all responsibilities to give actually the information from all perspective. We've been living in Asia, we know how they somehow, how they think. I mean, we can contribute somehow to the discussion because why are we living to this cold war mentality it's ignorance people have no clue you know when you are in thailand when you are in china you realize that expectation of thai people chinese people are the same they want prosperity they want to put food on their table they they want the same you know the same freedom as as, as the west is claiming they want 
that <laughs> they want that yeah. but it's tangible here that's the big difference in asia in the global south people are talking about tangible stuff when you come up with something like oh i want freedom well you know just we we repeat over and over can you eat freedom and what, what is, is that really a freedom you know very often yeah. it's not you know it's it's hidden there's there are hidden agendas there but let's let's get back to the yeah. topics no right? that's good all, all good points because <laughs> all of this you know the root of the the situation in ukraine uh sri lanka japan here in thailand it's all about the the proxy war between a unipolar west and a multipolar rest of the world uh so yeah let's let's go right into ukraine uh, I'm I'm going to do a video on this. It'll be much more in detail and all of the links and everything will be available. But let's just take a look at this map, Defense Politics Asia. And I want to thank everyone in the audience who continuously uh, recommended this. This is a great resource and it's always updating for some reason much faster than the pro-Ukrainian liveuamap.com. And I want to zoom in. I hope it doesn't crash everything like liveuamap.com does. I want to go to northern Donbas, uh, outside of Severodonetsk and Lizichansk, which is over here. And you can see the front has moved up to Seversk. Seversk uh, and uh, Bakhmut down here, that, that, that is the current defense line that Russia is working on. Once they overcome that, they're going to continue on their way to Kramatorsk and uh, Slavyansk. And right now they're outside of Seversk. So this is a, this is one of the main parts of this defense line. They're already outside of it. And we kept hearing how Russia is in this operational pause. Uh, they're not in an operational pause if they're already surrounding a, another uh, city or small town. That's not an operational pause. So these, this is the wishful thinking of the Western media. We've also been hearing a lot of sound about the HIMARS. And I just want to, again, I want to put this into perspective for people. The HIMARS, it's a, it's a multiple launch rocket system. Ukraine had many of these at the beginning of the conflict in February of this year, and they lost them all. They are, they're all being destroyed. They have a, a very small number remaining, and now the U.S. is sending these HIMARS. They're supposedly more accurate, and they're saying they're hitting targets behind the, the front line, which is, is probably true. And they're probably hitting some important stuff as well. But, you know, Russia is not going to just sit there and, and take it. They're going to adapt to it. They've already destroyed two of these high Mars. Uh, and another thing I want to point out is I've been seeing recent footage coming out of Lizzie Chance because they as they clean it up and, and start rebuilding it already and, you know, starting to get it back on its feet. They've come across some of these warehouses that they hit during the fighting and they found the M777s destroyed and the trucks that pulled them. And this type of truck that was pulling the M777s, it's the same type of truck that the HIMARS is built on. And if they could destroy the, the ones pulling the M777s, they can definitely destroy the HIMARS. It's not it's not stealth, it's not super armored, it's just a truck with rockets on the back. The, the thing that makes it dangerous is that it can fire long distances accurately. Other than that, it's very vulnerable on the battlefield. When the U.S. uses HIMARS, they use them in a combined arms fashion. So they'll have the rocket launchers on the battlefield, but ahead of that, they'll have infantry, they'll have armor, they'll have anti-tank units. They also assume that they will have air, uh, air superiority. Ukraine has none of these things. So they're even more vulnerable than, than they normally would be. I just want people to keep that in mind. It's not, it's not a, a moment to panic. Russia is not panicking. I don't think anyone else should be panicking over these high Mars. What have you been hearing or, or what do you think about these high Mars now that they're, you know, we're hearing uh, the Western media singing their praises like they did for the M777s? Well, it's always the same story. They want to, to, to uh, I mean, show some kind of gain. They, they need to show some kind of gain. I mean, because why? Because at the, at the moment, the globe, the, the collective West is paying $9 billion per month. And they want to see results and uh so here what zelensky is trying to do is pr stunts trying to you know it's communication war but on the ground it's a different reality you know there, there are ratios you know um, i mean serious uh, anal uh, analysis on, on what is happening in ukraine we are talking about artillery 10 to 1 ratio you know i mean russia is way stronger uh in terms of uh, losses you know it's probably uh, at least 10 to 1 
for one Russian death, there are 10 Ukrainians dying. And, and, and I think there are, well, after Donbass, you have this second line, which is Slavyansk, uh, Kramatorsk. Once this is gone, Ukraine is gone. Uh, what you had in Donbass was the strongest side of a uh, uh, Ukrainian army, the most, the, 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 the most equipped, the, the, the better trained, the one that actually they were trained for eight years. Do you think, you know, no matter how much you're going to send to Ukraine, but you, you will need to train those people. It's not like you sent a tank. Uh, you know, the people that were actually driving tanks are, I mean, mostly are dead. You know, 80% yeah. of the, the hardware from the military army from Ukraine is, has been destroyed. That's the reality. And so what, what we're doing here is dragging on this war. And, and, and Ukraine is, is lost. Actually, Ukraine lost the 24th of February was already was already done. Uh, yeah. Now what we're doing is criminal. We're making drag. This war is dragging on. And it's enriching the military industrial complex, some politicians, Ukrainian elites. I, I just want to point out just one thing. You know, uh, I did some quick calculation, GDP of Ukraine. Uh, there's a 50% decrease. Additional to that, there's probably, uh, you know, the Donbass southern region, they account for 50% of uh, Ukraine's GDP. So the current GDP of Ukraine is probably around 30 to $35 billion. We are paying on a monthly basis $9 billion. Do you think it's going to the economy? No, no, this is going to enrich Ukrainian elites. And it's, a, it's another money, money laundering scheme. The same as they did with, with, uh, with Afghanistan. I mean, remember Afghanistan, how much did we spend? I mean, did the West spend trillions of dollars? And, and you know what? Overnight, what happened with the uh, with Afghani army? You know, the Taliban, they, they didn't have to fight. Uh, yeah. And it's, it is the same. So once Donbass is gone, the war is gone. It's over. It's over. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that's important to remember. The, the U.S. tried to create an army out of nothing in Syria. Didn't work. They tried to do it in Afghanistan. Didn't work. In Iraq, I think it's a, a mixed bag because I think uh, most of the Iraqi military's successes on the battlefield are owed to Iran. And um, I, I saw this question, and uh, these are not super chats. These are just the questions that I'm putting up on the screen. What do you think about Russia buying Iranian drones? I don't, I don't, I don't think that that's been confirmed. I don't think that's a real story. It, you know, Iran does make really good drones. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I don't think that Russia needs. To buy them from Iran. And I think it was just, I just think it's the US doing what they were trying to do to China, also trying to rope them all in to this so that they could poison all of them with their, you know, it's like a, you know, to bring them all in so they can poison all of these countries at one time with their anti, with their Ukraine propaganda. So they don't have to tell three different lies about three different countries. They could just lie about them all together, trying to consolidate it and make it a little more efficient. Have you seen any, any information that, makes you think that, that that's happening, Angelo? Well, Russia has all the technology it needs. It has actually Russia, which Russia is extremely strong, is the procurement. It doesn't need Iran to produce drones for Russia. Uh, so here they want to link uh, Iran to Russia, uh, the same as they, they, they wanted to link China to Russia, just by saying, well, you know, China is helping financially, it's helping by passing sanctions. And they, they, they are going over time, they'll, they'll try to, to uh, point at China as maybe delivering an army. Uh, I mean, whatever. I mean, you know, you, there's no limit to the lies. The, you know, there's no limit. So Russia doesn't need doesn't need China. I mean, why would it need to China? It's a uh, Russia could actually take over Europe if he really wanted. Here, this special operation is just they're trying to limit the damage as much as possible. You know, and they and they they were very clear from the beginning. It was extremely clear. You know, people are still asking questions. What do Russia wants to do with Ukraine? Do they want to take all Ukraine? Or, you know, th there was a threat at the door of Russia. There was a genocide happening. They wanted to enter into Donbass and, and, and just to do the culture the genocide of Russian speakers. And they were very clear about this. So Russia intervened before Ukrainian forces would invade Donbass. And demilitarization, denazification. How, I mean, how more clear than that? Can we, can we, yeah. you know, and it's going, and that's, with what, its own that's what pace. they're doing too. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's going, you know, Russia is going with its own pace, you know, the Western media, they're trying to actually say, you know, oh, 
is is slowing you know it's not go, or going according to russian plan i mean do they know russian plan uh you know do, you know russia is doing it, its things you know rationally it's been all planned while the contrast with, from the west is something extremely erratical emotional you know do you see russia being emotional now they're not they they are like chess masters they're doing you know move by, by moves but everything has been planned yeah. on the european perspective right now it's just like they it's just tactical it's on a daily basis uh they make a move and then they have to change because they they, they see it's, it's hurting themselves uh, yeah yeah so it's 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 like it's like kids in the room you know i mean they are kids they're behaving like kids we need a multiple world with adults in the room now yeah it, it really seems that way um the, a, another question i thought this maybe you could give us some insight on this one angelo uh russia is actually making moves to allow ukraine to export its its grain and uh, Russian exports are suffering. Everything that Russia exports is suffering, at least uh, to the Western world. Uh, so uh, why would they do this? Well, I think because Ukraine, th th their grain has been very oversold by the West. They tried to make this out to be a much larger crisis than it really is. It's US-led sanctions against Russia that are raising fuel and food prices. It's raising fuel prices, fertilizer prices, and food prices, these, these sanctions. Ukraine exporting their grain or not exporting their grain is, is really a drop in the bucket, at, at least from what I understand. Uh, so this is more of a political move for Russia to take this piece off the board. The US can't use this against Russia anymore if they facilitate the export of Ukrainian grain. What are they gonna say then once that happens? Uh, it's not. I don't think it's going to hurt Russia. It's just going to help them take a political piece off the board. What do you think about that one, Angelo? Well, I, I think there's an important information to put here into this uh, this grain issue. Uh, who mined the sea routes? Who mined yeah. the sea routes? Ukraine did. Ukraine did. Don't do. You know they're doing reverse accusation. So Russia, they're like, you know what? Well, it's it's okay. You can you you know you you can export your grain there's we don't have any problem with that and actually they they overestimate you know what ukraine is is exporting it's it's nowhere near what what uh, russia is exporting russia is it's massive so they're just trying to depict you uh, russia is being making the the global south to suffer you know because because of uh, this grain issue so it's it's all about mining so russia they're like well you know we uh, let's find a solution together you know so uh, so uh, and I mean, I that's, think, that's, I think, what, that's what Russia is doing to get the grain out of Ukraine is circumventing exactly. the, the mined ports that are still under Ukrainian control because all of the ports under Russian control have been demined and there's safe passage uh, for any ship that wants to come or go from those ports, but they cannot get into Odessa. They cannot get out of Odessa because just like you said, they've been mined. The ports have been mined. Um, speaking of, um, well, let's see. I'm trying to think of a good way to go into well there's a lot of there's a lot of connections between the situation in Ukraine and the situation in Sri Lanka uh, let's see let's go to share screen I, I just want to get this out of the way real quick because yes Russia and China are the two main adversaries for the US so uh, Sri Lanka is the the you know part of the anti-china campaign so they we've been hearing in the Western media that Sri Lanka is suffering because of Chinese debt trap diplomacy. This is DW, this is Western media, this is German state media. They're, they're obviously no friends of China or Russia, uh, but they, they're admitting who Sri Lanka owes their debt to. China is just 10%, Japan is 10%. Why aren't they blaming Japan for their debt trap diplomacy? Uh, World Bank is nine. Asian Development Bank, even though it says Asian, it's mostly Western financial institutions that use it as a tool uh, to financially control countries that they're preying on predatory lending. Uh, same with the IMF. Uh, so China is 10%, Asian Development Bank is 13%, and market borrowing is 47%. And this DW article even says that that's, that's the main problem, this market borrowing, these, uh, what are they, what are they called? Uh, these bonds. It's these bonds that uh, have been bought up, bought up by who? It says in this article, Nikkei Asia, 
Let me just uh, black. BlackRock, Alliance, UBS, HSBC, JP Morgan Chase, and Prudential. These are all Western financial institutions. If if debt is the reason why Sri Lanka's economy is collapsing, then it's because uh, the debt that the West is holding, not China. Uh, Angela, uh, what, what are your first thoughts on this whole situation? Well, I'm going to give like very simple information. And uh, I mean, just to expose this all uh, uh, narrative, fake news about debt trap, you know, uh, accusing China. Just to give you information, China does uh, loans money on a much longer term. So countries don't have the pressure that, you know, of repayment. That's one thing. Uh, then it loans money upon uh, feasibility studies. So physical, tangible project. It's about tangible project and the revenues tied to those projects. Additional to that, Reuters, this week, there was an article saying that China, and they admitted that China actually is lending money at half the rates of what Western institutions are lending. Additional to that, China is not imposing restructuring, you know, of the economy or, you know, reforms when it comes to politics. So China is respecting the country's sovereignty. What the IMF is doing is coming to a country and say, is, is going to say, well, I'm going to loan you one billion dollar, but you have to do privatization. You have to sell those assets to our friends. Uh, you have to accept NGOs, which are going to meddle to the, the politics. So it's a huge loss of sovereignty. China is different, you know, and the conditions are much better. I want to add one thing. When it comes to Sri Lanka, there's a case where China actually took over a port. So China had built a port and uh, there was some lending. And at some point, some, uh, some loans were due uh, to be paid by, to the IMF and uh, Sri Lanka didn't have the money. So they asked China, well, we, are, we can give you or port 100 years of lease. And if you can help us paying off the loans of the IMF. So you see China, you know, China came out to help. You know, it was a request from Sri Lanka. And what they're trying to depict here was that the loan, original loan, uh, there was- Was a Chinese due, loan. Was a Chinese loan. It was not. Yeah. China yeah. helped out in this. So this whole, you know, it's this reverse accusation. China is not doing debt trap. China yeah. is not, it's not doing the mafia style racketeering because it's racketeering. So yeah. now we, you have this talk about BRICS uh, trying to actually challenge the IMF, the World Bank. They are going to issue the same system, but with different conditions. And, you know, and, and for... And, and they're going to care about the countries. It's go, you know, especially when it comes to sovereignty, and 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 uh, thinking about the welfare of people. You know, when you come into the country, you know what they did to Bolivia. They go into Bolivia and they say, "Well, we are going to privatize water." Can you imagine? They they were even the water they would come. I mean, from from uh, the, the rain. They said, "You can not amass that water." I mean, this is like it's private. Uh, yeah. So this is what they do, you know, and, and, and they, uh, you know, they're trying to create those economies, which are colonial era economies, you know, monoculture. They say, you are going to grow only this. They yeah. make sure you are not self-sufficient and they make sure you, you don't get industrialized economies. So when you look at this green agenda, they talk about, oh, you need to be green and so on. Actually, this is a way to further make sure that they don't get industrialized and they don't they don't become self-sufficient so this yeah. you see when you, you look at russia russia the last 10 years they did everything to become self-sufficient this is why the sanctions are not working now when you have sri lanka they depend on imports you know everything they need currencies foreign currencies now what happened with COVID? you know there was COVID. they were dependent on tourism and the, the gas prices are high oil prices are high well how can you repay how can you repay yeah. so no way. Enslaving, this is the debt trap enslaving those countries and you see i mean china is only 10 percent. i mean those are factual you know it's factual only 10 percent, and the lending at half the rates of what western countries are lending yeah that that's all really important to understand the the original and only debt trappers is the west and their imf the World Bank, Asian Development Bank. Uh, I don't want to put this one up on the screen here. Please don't insult Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan people saying these protests are foreign funded. Most 
of protest leaders are leftists. Well, in Thailand, they all claim that they're leftists too. And I know for a fact that they're funded by and working with the US government and, and serving US interests at the expense of Thai interests. Now, uh, I just wanna point this out. This is very important. Uh, this is an article originally from Reuters. I did a video on this this week. Uh, like I said, these, these discussions together, uh, live discussions, kind of a roundup. And they're, they're talking about if the Western media is singing the praises of protesters, you know somewhere uh, someone is being funded and promoted by the West. They will not promote these protests if they were working against U.S. Western interests. And so I looked in here and I saw this name right here. He's a digital strategist and he was involved, according to Reuters, in organizing these mobs. So I looked him up. This is his LinkedIn. You know, it's not, I, I, I'm not looking at some secret leaked document. This is his public profile. Everyone can check it. And I was scrolling down until I saw this campaign volunteer 2019 2020 at this organization, P A F F R E L. And immediately I recognized this. This is um, the, the Sri Lankan version uh, of this organization, A N F R E L. R-E-L, which is on their website as an international affiliate. Uh, and this, I know for a fact, is funded by the U.S. government because this is the same organization that meddles in Thailand's elections. And it's listed on the NED's official website under Asia Regional. It's right down here, Asian Network for Free Elections Foundation. Uh, so at least some of the protest leaders in Sri Lanka are funded by the U.S. government, are backed by the U.S. government, and are pursuing US interests at the expense of Sri Lanka's interests. That's not to say, because when I was looking at the main opposition party and the, the party that is uh, being ousted from pow power, they both have cooperated with the US and they've both cooperated with China. I couldn't really get a, a feeling or find any evidence that said, yes, this, this is the party they want in power. I couldn't really get that feeling. Uh, people are more than, uh, more than welcome to offer any additional information. But as I'm doing my research, I found uh, people like this in the, the Reuters article, they're definitely funded by the US government. They're smaller opposition groups that are extremely anti-China, which is irrational. So why would you take an irrational stance? Because someone is, is backing you to do that, either uh, certain factions in India or, or the US government or both. Uh, Angela, have you seen any evidence of U.S. meddling in Sri Lanka and, and particularly involved in these protests? Uh, again, to a financial crisis precipitated by Western debt trapping and predatory loaning. Well, here it's a combination of uh, decades of uh, Western meddling. Uh, remember all those countries that actually they were de supposedly decolonized. Uh, what they did, they, they just left. I mean, the army left, but they left the, the seeds for division you know i mean in sri lanka i mean we not long ago there was a civil war the tamil you know they were funded actually by the us and and you have re remains of those uh, you know colonial era uh, uh, meddling uh, the same as you have in myanmar so here you have a young democracy and and they they actually managed to to get their hands pretty much everywhere what they call in what they call the civil society I just want to remember, I think it's nice, it's always good just to remind people what NED, the NED, National Endowment for Democracy, stands for. You know, it's, it's just a rebranded name for the CIA. It's the propaganda arm, it's a regime change arm of the CIA. What they did, they just rename it and they say, well, this is National Endowment for Democracy. So whenever you see that funding, well, if there are politicians or NGOs being funded by NED, you know what they are? You are just agents. If you are from Myanmar or if you are from Sri Lanka and you're getting money from them, you are being an agent. You are a traitor and you're working against the interests of your own country. I just want to like point this yeah. out because, um, again, this happens every time the U.S. engineers unrest in another country. You have these people who are utterly, they are picked aside, they invested heavily, and they don't care if you show them evidence, a written confession from these people that they are puppets of the U.S. government. He's telling me to please look up the Inter-University Students Federation. I don't need to because it's in this Reuters article. It's right here. And they're, they're getting this information from the guy who's funded by the NED. So um, go to the, don't, don't ask me to ask these people. I already looked into it. You go ask them about the NED and ask them what they're 
feeling is about the NED interfering in Sri Lanka's internal political affairs. And their answer or lack thereof will tell you everything you need to know about how genuine or disingenuous they're actually being. Uh, this has happened here in Thailand. I, I've, I've seen this with my own eyes. I've been in these NGOs offices. Uh, when I was writing under my pen name, no one knew who I was, so I could go anywhere I wanted. I would, I would uh, be involved in some of these NGOs and I would go into their offices and I, I would see for myself what they were doing. Uh, I, I'm not saying this to rain on your parade. I'm saying this because this is the truth and you need to know this. If you're unwittingly, if you're unwittingly participating or supporting foreign interference in your country, that, that is going to destroy your country. However, however bad you think the situation is in Sri Lanka, and it is pretty bad, getting a US proxy in power is worse. And if you, you can't, because I have Absolutely. people in Malaysia used to say this to me, oh, Brian, the government in Malaysia is so bad, it couldn't possibly get worse. Get a U.S. proxy who, who only serves U.S. interests and it will get worse. I promise you, look at Ukraine. They're going to destroy that country down to the last brick because it's a yeah, U.S. Yeah. regime. I, I want to add one, one thing, Brian. I think it's very important to point out what we are doing here is only exposing foreign influence. And yeah. we are not saying that actually Sri Lanka government, the, the ministers, and there's no corruption. Of course, they, they have their, their own problems. Yeah. What, what we are saying is that only Sri Lankans can solve their own problems. Once you have foreign meddling, they don't, they don't care about Sri Lankans. They are going to, I mean, they're going to divide and conquer, destroy, uh, sell you your state-owned assets, what they call liberalizing your economy. I mean, this is, this is destructive. So this is what we're pointing out. So we're not saying that Sri Lanka government is good. No, I, I mean, every government has its own problems. What they do, those NGOs do, and NED do, uh, they, they meddle, they, they try to find a cause, the you know, problems, and they, 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 they start to amplify and hijack cause. So remember in, in Hong Kong, it started with the income inequalities. I mean, you know, there's housing problems. There's many problems, of course. Yeah. They go into that and they change, they hijack, and then overnight you see like, oh, people start uh, waving uh, foreign flags. It's like, well, it started with housing issues, and that's that's how they do. Uh, so so Sri Lanka, it's, it's another example. So we're not backing those 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 government. No, we're just exposing foreign, foreign interference. Yeah, exactly, and like, like I said, I, I've seen some opposition groups, part of the protest, where I, I couldn't really find any U.S. backing for them. They may be genuinely involved. They might. They uh, it might be opportunistic, where they okay. They see these protests, and you know the government is on its way out. So maybe I'm on my way in. So they take advantage of it. But yeah. there are definitely, definitely U.S. funded groups. If you're going to talk about uh, student unions, the U.S. has infiltrated virtually every university on earth. There's hardly a university on earth that the U.S. hasn't infiltrated and isn't funding groups. Uh, yapping about democracy, and it's always Western-style democracy. And all, all of this is just a way of call, young people are very impressionable, and uh, they're very easy to impress with these slogans and these ideas because they don't know. They don't know how things actually work, how difficult it is to actually do these things. And so, yeah, they will, they will get those are always the ones in, in Hong Kong. It was students, students carrying out the U.S.-backed uh, interference. And here at Thailand, now it's students. It's a student movement. They're all brainwashed by these programs that the U.S. has set up in their universities. Uh, Angela, you were you were there in Hong Kong. It's mostly young people, wasn't it? No, exactly. I mean, it's easy to, to sell some ideas to young people. You know, they play on generation. You know, you have a one generation brainwashed on Western ideals, you know, uh, so, you know, they, they grew up with, with uh, Hollywood, with, they actually, they, they grew up with books that were telling them a different, um, different, uh, history about, uh, about Hong Kong. The reason is that you had like foreign NGOs, which had their hands into the school ed education system. And remember that actually they, they, the, uh, the UK, England planted the seeds of color revolution before the handover 1997. And later it was taken over by uh, um, uh, mainly US NGOs. And you, I mean, all, all of them were here, you know, including George Soros, yeah. you know, they, they have that. I mean, we're talking about millions of dollars and over time you can change, you can change a generation. And it's much easier with kids. I mean, kids, you know, you yeah. you tell them, you know, people, they, they want to fight for a cause. They say, oh, you know what? The, 
the the you know climate change you know you you see those radicals okay there are problems and so on but here you need to look at the manipulation the funding and the the yes. ulterior motives you, you know exactly they, you know this you have this woke culture you know this woke culture oh lgtb cause oh we you know equality minorities uh, uh, uh we are ex genders and so on it's like well think about it are you uh, who planted the idea yeah who's and, who's and, yeah yeah no go no go ahead Angela. yeah yeah well it's, it's the divide and conquer it's this yes. whole thing about dividing and actually it's distracting people from the real issues real issues is class struggle it's elites that are getting rich at the expense of average joe you know and yeah. and people are manipulated and you see dividing themselves you know i give you an example i mean you know when you have uh, those uh, those uh, what do you call like the, the proud boys the black, white guys and the, the the black guy black people blm what do they have in yeah. common they all come from poor society you know the the the, the ones that actually are, are working 24 7 you know they're slaves they're working minimum wage they, they don't even can can afford housing and yeah. actually they manage to divide them yeah. what what they have in common is actually they are victims of the elites so you see how the elites actually are putting them against each other. I'm not yeah. pro BLM and pro Proud Boys, but you know, in the old days, the the same people, you know, the Black Panthers, they, they were they would actually ally with those those white white guys, you know, uh, from the countryside, from you know the the Midwest. They they were allies because they did understand that the elites were manipulating them against each other, and yeah. they fought they fought together actually back then. So you and see. You know, people, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say, I mean, if you go join the U.S. military, that's who it is. It's people from the inner cities, people from the countryside, yeah. people from from, you know, I wouldn't say impoverished, but they're not, they're not well to do. I can tell you that uh, this comment that I got on the screen here, this student union that we're talking about, the Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan student union that we were just talking about. It's a leftist party. They met U.S. the U.S. ambassador, too. And this is the point. The opposition in Thailand claims to be leftist socialist, even communist. They are not. They number one, they're anti-China. Number two, you can you can say anything. You can say you're any type of IST, any kind of ist that you want. But just like Angelo just said, you need to follow the money. Uh, analysis by ideology, analysis by analogy, this this is highly flawed. You need to just do analysis by follow the money and you will always get to the truth of any matter. Uh, so the groups here in Thailand, I've traced the money back to the US. They're all working with the US. So how are you actually socialist if you're working with, and people would say, no, there's no way they're funded by the US. Yes, I, I have the receipts. I can show you. It's on their own website. They are funded by the US government. There's nothing socialist about them at all. This is camouflage. They are camouflaging themselves so that you don't realize that they're uh, just a puppet of you know, like, what would a puppet of the U.S. look like if they didn't somehow try to camouflage? Very elementary, but yet it's 2022 and people are still falling for this. Uh, let's let's see. Um, is there anything else we want to talk about, uh, Sri Lanka? Uh, no, Angela, well, just, I, I just want to add, you know, a, a few uh, a couple of months ago, Victoria Nuland actually traveled to Sri Lanka. I mean, you know, yeah. just uh, it's a red light. And also something that, uh, you know, recently, I mean, a month ago, you had uh, the opposition party that were meeting with the U.S. ambassador. I mean, you know, it, it is suspicious. It is suspicious. But I don't have the facts. You you did uh, some work there. You know, I mean, we we, we cannot actually dig that deep into every single country we did our homework in when it came to myanmar to thailand to hong kong uh sri lanka it's new information i mean more more things will will uh, will come out so um, so we're just pointing out at what we we find out and, and actually uh, people that are following actually are giving us uh some additional information yeah. yeah, and and what's funny too about the the current protests here in Thailand, these an highly, extremely anti-Chinese and very pro-U.S. and they they glorify the the Communist Party of Thailand, which no longer exists. And even when it did exist, it, it was one of these things where you you had real communist movements in the region, but this was not one of them. They were operating in exactly the same area the U.S. military was stationed in Thailand during the Vietnam War, and they never struck one of the, the US bases, not even one time. Uh, and they were fighting with the Thai uh, military, 
And what was this? This was like ISIS in Iraq. The US is pretending they're fighting ISIS, but actually ISIS is this artificial threat that they created so that they could sell the necessity of a US military presence in the country easier to the Iraqi leadership. It's, it, you know, it's a threat that they created and that they're also using to justify them being there in Iraq, but also to affect Iran, Syria, and everywhere else in the region. The US has been doing this for so long. Again, it, I can't believe it's 2022 and people are still following for this. I, I Honestly, uh, but not yeah. since I see people talking about um, Taiwan. Well, we're talking about Sri Lanka because uh, this is another front against China. What about Taiwan, which is actually part of China? What about the, the assassination of Shinzo Abe? You know, let me get the uh, let me get the link up here that you sent me right before the show started. Um, this NPR article, after being silent for decades, Japan now speaks up about Taiwan and angers China. Oh, this is from last year, actually. So they they've been doing this for a while, Angela. Um, what what are some of your thoughts? Now we we can't prove any of this, so this is just speculation. Again, New Atlas Live. This is you know it's more of a discussion. We might put some ideas out there just uh, just just to speculate, just to think about. Um, Angela, what, what are some of your thoughts about the assassination? Assassinations are notoriously difficult to get to the bottom of. No, I, uh, I it, it is pure speculation. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, we are always factual. We, we work on factual, but uh, it's just suspicious, a bit suspicious two days before, before the election. Uh, I remember in 2014, you had a, a uh, assassination at attempt of a uh, Chen Shui-bian in Taiwan, and actually we found out that it was a completely fake. Uh, they, uh, you know, the opposition Kuomintang, they asked, you know, some proof, and uh, the DPP, the Independent uh, Independentist Party, they actually asked for from American uh, doctors to be to be uh, sent to to check on Chen Shui-bian, but he had uh, he had minor scratches, he had nothing. It's just a bit suspicious, but I, you know, I don't want to speculate too much on that. Uh, just one thing, I mean, uh, maybe we can analyze maybe Shinzo Abe and his party, LDP, and actually the link since the 50s and 60s, I sent you an article about this. The New York, New York Times article uh, in 1994 uh, is, is actually exposing the links of the, this party with the CIA. So the same as you had uh, right-wing parties in, uh, for example, in Italy, I mean, something that I, I know quite quite well, you know, what we call Democrazia Cristiana was actually funded by the CIA. So you have all, uh, you know, you have Japan, you have uh, Italy, you have th those countries in the 50s and 60s had funding, heavy funding from the CIA. So now you have uh, uh, Japan, which actually in 2014, they... Uh, they did a reinterpretation of the constitution. You know, Japan has a pacifist constitution, meaning that they're not supposed to be aggressive, military aggressive. What they did in 2014 is to reinterpret their constitution. So what they say in this reinterpretation is that Japan could actually help come at the help of an ally. Now, when you see that, and when you see actually what happened in two, 2021, when you had the deputy... Uh, um, uh, defense minister of Japan that said, we are, our responsibility is to protect Taiwan. Now you see where we're going. Additional to that, uh, LDP is actually talking about, if they have a, a, a super majority, they are actually talking about rewriting, changing the constitution into having a military that actually can do power projection. So you see where we're going. Yeah. What the U.S. needs in order to contain China is to have access to army bases in, ideally, in Japan and South Korea. South Korea, I don't know, but Japan is a high probability, and to be able to launch attacks from there. Why? You know, I mean, the reason is very simple. If you have only aircraft, aircraft right now can be can be sunk, you know, by hyper, you know, uh, uh, aircraft you know, carrier. Yeah, aircraft carriers, they, yeah. Can, can, be, uh, they can be sunk by, by the, those new missiles, uh, hypersonic missiles, right? Yeah. Uh, now, the only way you can contain China is using those bases around China, do a blockade, and maybe launch some, you know, some attacks, you know, maybe from, from Korea and Japan. But you see, I mean, this is, this is a scenario where the U.S. would fight to the last Japanese. 
the U.S. would fight yeah. to the last coin. Does it sound similar? You know, familiar. You know, U.S. is fighting Russia to the last Ukrainian. Well, this is this is what those countries are are facing. And, and, and I mean, the message is to Koreans. If if they are Koreans or Japanese, listening to us. I mean, don't fall into the trap. You know, they're being used. And you see this meddling. You know, you have. I mean, is Japan a sovereign state? There's 50,000 troops, U.S. troops in Japan since World War yeah. II. Uh, now you have this funding from the 50s, 60s, from the CIA. New York Times articles. I'm not spe speculating here. But de facto, Japan is a vassal state. It lost World War II, and since World War II, it's a vassal state. And now it is projecting itself as being the forefront, on the forefront for fighting uh, a war against China on behalf of the U.S. And uh, I, I just want to point this out to to people. And we, we were talking about this before. Also, who is who do you think Japan's largest trade partner is? And who do you who do you think benefits from Japan being belligerent towards China? Do you think J Japanese people benefit in any shape, form or way? And the answer is obviously no. You don't even need me to show you who their their biggest trade partner is. But I, I'm going to show you anyway. And even though that says 20, you got to remember, you have to add in Hong Kong, China and Hong Kong, and also Taiwan, because it's all China. And, and then they are obviously the largest export market for Japan. And then when you do imports, China wins easily. And this is what was going on with Ukraine. Before 2014, they had a, a very important relationship with Russia. They were also cultivating a relationship with the West. They had the best of both worlds. And then the 2014 US engineered coup undid all of that. They they completely sabotaged their relationship with Russia, not just diplomatically, but also economically. Their economy began collapsing. Thailand actually had a tank deal with Ukraine before 2014, and then it could, the, the tanks couldn't be delivered. So Thailand turned to China for their main battle tanks uh, instead of Ukraine. And that was because Ukraine went and shot themselves in the foot because of a US installed client regime. And they're doing the same thing in Japan. Japan does not have an independent foreign policy. Like you said, Angela, there's tens of thousands of US troops in Japan to ensure that they don't have an independent. How can you have an independent foreign policy when you have a foreign military with tens of thousands of troops in your country? Who, a who asked for them to be there? The Japanese people didn't. Know. You could say, well, World War II, that was, that was, uh, that was, generation, that was a generation at least ago. You know, what about now? Why are they still there? They're there to contain China. And I think the I think the US even more or less says that. And and again, like you said, with the aircraft carriers, a lot of these patrols that the US and its allies fly to inspect North Korea, but they're also off the coast of China, they're flown from Japan. Uh, so it's 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 really important to point that out, how important this is for the US. And when you know, when you see an assassination or a terrorist attack or any of these type of developments, uh, a coup. Um, let's see what else, uh, economic collapse. Just ask yourself who benefits the most from this. And that will point you generally in the right direction of who, who is actually responsible for it. Uh, you got, you, is there anything else you want to yeah. add to that, well, Angelo? I, I, I'd like to add something that we point out very often is uh, this concept of democracy. I mean, democracy, you need, in order to have a democracy, you need a sovereign state. Uh, because democracy is a process of self-determination. This is very important. You know, many people, they claim, oh, we want to bring democracy here and there and so on. But, you know, it's, a, it's not, it shouldn't be imposed uh, with the values from the West and be, you know, manipulated. So it, this is what we're pointing out. We, if, you, if you are claiming that you want freedom and democracy, well, give them their sovereignty. Don't meddle. Let let Japanese decide for their own fate. So here, by definition, for me, Japan is not a democracy. The same as Italy and, and Germany, many of those countries are not democracy. Why? Because they don't have the prerequisites. Prerequisite, it's number one, sovereignty. Yeah. You have sovereignty, and then and then other other things. You know, uh, money meddling into politics, uh, media, who controls the media, and so on. And and then maybe we might get to a point where we get to this. Utopia of democracy, you know, there, there's only a few, few that actually can call themselves democracy. I mean, maybe Switzerland might be one of them because they have a direct 
direct system, direct vote, you know, uh, but otherwise, you know, they, they're just fake, you know. Actually, you need to be, to be very careful. It's very counterintuitive. You know, it's not the fact that you 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 have you cast a vote that is automatically a democracy. You know, it's the I would say it's the satisfaction level. You know, if you have people that are satisfied satisfied with the system, that's that's legitimacy. If you have deliverables and you have accountability, you know that you know I promise something and I deliver. Well, that's legitimacy. Uh, yeah. But not casting a vote. Casting a vote, it's it's oversimplification of, of what should be democracy. Yeah, and uh, pr President Xi of the CPC <laughs> says, "Trust me, you don't want democracy." Yeah, well, that that's the thing. I mean, uh, say say in China, when you really think about human nature, how it actually works versus uh, ideal visions of how it should work, you have your local elections. Local elections, the the general masses, that is about as much as they can wrap their their minds around what's going on, what's important to them who's being honest, who's lying, you know, locally they can see what's going on with their own eyes. Beyond that, it's, it starts to get a little bit too big. How, ask yourself, Americans voting for, you know, the fact that Americans vote when it so clearly makes no difference just goes to show you just how many people, they don't know nearly enough to, to, to have like this Western idea of democracy. It doesn't work. You could tell. You could just see that it doesn't work. They they are not properly informed. If you're not properly informed, there's no way uh, you could have a, a meaningful election. What it is, it's a system of control to make people in in the West think that they have control over what's going on. When in fact, all of these candidates running, they're all beholden to the these corporations, these financial institutions, and uh, so it doesn't matter who you vote for locally. Maybe that as you get up higher and higher, no. In China, they don't, I, they're not voting in the president. This is all done at, at the high, higher levels. That way, they can do plans for like 5, 10, 15, even 20 years. They can do that because there is no question about, they don't have to play games. There's no there's no power struggle, at least no serious power struggle. Say here in, say here in Thailand, because the elections, the candidates are not all controlled by the same special interests. You have... Uh, parties that represent Thailand's actual interests and you have parties that represent foreign interests. And so uh, the danger of these people getting into power backed by foreign interests, they're going to take the country in a completely different direction that does not represent Thailand's best interests, even if they can convince voters that, that they do. And you're going to set your country back 10 years, 15 years, 20 years because of the, the decisions and the holes that they dig and stick the country into. Uh, Western democracy, uh, it's a system of control. It's not actually a system of self-determination, not in the West and not in the countries that the West imposes it, imposes it on. It's a system of control. Uh, we, we've talked about this a lot, Angelo, in uh, previous yeah. videos. I'm trying to look through for other I, I was thinking, questions. Brian, do you have any recommendation? I think it would be nice to do, you know, like recommendation channels that we we like you know that we want to talk about you know i, I mean there's a few i mean it's very inspiring channel I, I like very much that i mean like you the duran the boat uh, alexander alex you know yeah. I mean, if you have like recommendation i think this this you know it's 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 very nice for us we get inspiration information from other channels and it's nice we you know it's um it's this movement of people creating content people are not satisfied about mainstream media and realizing, well, you know, we, maybe there's a contribution to bring in, you know, I mean, we started, you started this channel a year ago and uh, it's, it's a great satisfaction to see, you know, like the, the support, people people watching, you know, and, and this whole sharing that we, we're not alone. And, and uh, do you have any, any channels you'd, you'd like to recommend? I mean, I, I like Scott Twitter. There's, there's some amazing people out there really that uh, we'd love to recommend. Yeah, um, well, I was just, Right before uh, we, we went live, I was watching Ben Norton, his his uh, take on Sri Lanka's debt, and he, he's got a lot of extra information. And again, it's all from the Western media themselves saying it's not Chinese debt trap. It's it's the IMF. The IMF did this, however way they want to spin it. But all, all of the debt is the IMF and the institutions that control it and other Western you know, financial schemes. Uh, he, he's a very good source. And look, you don't have to agree with everything somebody says to consider them a good source. People are allowed to disagree. Focus on what you agree on and uh, 
you know, on your own, try to convince people of, of your point of view. And if, if they get it, they get it. And if they don't, they don't. It's not, it's not worth infighting. There's already we can make mistakes, religion. Brian. Yeah. We can make yeah. mistakes. We, we do sometimes, you know, I mean, apologies. Sometimes we, you know, there's so much work. There's so much work, you know, we dig into, you know, we, uh, but, but we're trying as much as possible to be factual, you know. I mean, speculation, yes, sometimes we, we but we, when we speculate, we say it's a speculation, but we're not, yes. you know, we, we are, you and I, we are, how can I say, average Joe. We, we're just trying to, you know, this, this, uh, you know, because the West, Western media, mainstream media are not doing their job, and we, we feel the responsibility to come out and, and say something. I mean, somehow, if, it, if, we, if the, the two decades you spend in Thailand and the two decades I spend in, in China can help out into, into this confrontation between two worlds, you know, maybe, you know, and, and, and this, is, this is why we're doing this. Um, yeah. So apologies if we sometimes we are, we, we might, you know, we're not experts in, in everything. Yeah, um, I see people talking about uh, Jackson Henkel. Yeah, he's he's good. Apparently, he's so good that YouTube wants he's him. He's young. Off, so. He's young. Yeah, you told me. He's, how old is he? How old is like, he? I think uh, he like said a, he's like a twenties, like early twenties or something amazing. like that. That's crazy. It's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. Really. I wish yeah. I had it figured out more uh, or less. Earl Grey, <laughs> Earl Grey from out of from Moscow. There's a fr good French one. You know, actually, uh, Stratpol. You know, it's in French. It's amazing. Yeah. Like really good follow up on Ukraine. I mean the. There's lots of great guys, you know, Grey Zone, of course. I mean, they're fantastic, you know, uh, yeah. Max Blumenthal. I mean, there's, you know, there's plenty of channels, you know, and, and we get inspiration from them too, really. Yeah, and if you, you follow uh, a lot of these people like the Duran, they get a lot of interesting people on their show too. And then you yeah. can start following their work. And again, you don't, you don't have to agree with everything, but there's good points that people will make. Even people that you absolutely hate, you should listen to them with an open mind because they might say something by accident that might might be useful you know just yeah you know, I, you know, it's not a, it doesn't have to be zero sum all the time uh even though there are some people that i you know there's a lot of things that i don't you know i don't you know i don't like about somebody but uh you know yeah i, I would say you problems, know enough division as yeah. it is can i give you just a few examples you know i mean you know, like, you know, like how people, they want to put people into boxes, you know, I know, I mean, yeah. uh, for example, Tucker Carlson, I mean, Tucker Carlson is, you know, uh, you know, sometimes it can be wrong on some topics, it can be anti-Chinese and so on. But you know what, right now on Ukraine is one of the very few mainstream media that is actually telling the truth about Ukraine. So why don't we set aside, okay, what he's saying about China, you don't like it, but listen to what he's saying about Ukraine. Yeah. Same well, as, what, 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 what would be great is if people could say he's everyone could agree he's right about Ukraine, yeah. uh, but he's totally wrong about China. You know what I'm worried about is that because, uh, you know, you're not on Fo you're not on Fox. You're not on Fox yeah, yeah. and being anti-establishment. Of course. Of course. For sure. So <laughs> what I'm worried no. is that this is just yeah. a way to uh, get get people who are still kind of awake yeah. and, and being reasonable, but for some reason they still watch Fox, you know, why? But, yeah. to, but to get them <laughs> on the anti-China train, which is, you know, that is the main target. Yeah. China is the main target. It, they have a bigger population. They're, in many ways, they already have a bigger economy. They're going to have the biggest economy, the most powerful military. This is the West's worst nightmare, a non-white nation that surpasses all of them collectively. Uh, this is their yeah. worst nightmare and they will do anything to stop it. And uh, I'm just worried that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you're you're anti-China, you know, why? You ask yourself why. I have a lot of new subscribers. I, I say this often, it's a problem. I have a lot of new subscribers that come from my U Ukrainian coverage and they say, I agree with you on Ukraine, but you're totally wrong about China. Mm -hmm. Well, I, all of my analysis that I do uh, regarding Ukraine is all based on everything that I've worked out living here in Asia, which includes my analysis of China. I've been to China and these people who are extremely anti-China, ask yourself, have you been to China? What do you actually know about China? Who's telling you all of these things about China that you don't like? Is it the same people that are telling you stuff about Ukraine you know is a lie? And why are you picking and choosing this about China to believe when you know they're lying to you about Ukraine or Iraq or uh, Syria, yeah. Afghanistan, all of these other places. Uh, and, and people have to ask themselves and be honest about what their own personal prejudices are. Because I know a lot. I, I was born and raised in the United States. I know there's a lot of racist people in America who don't want to admit that they're racist, but they definitely are. I, I saw it with my own eyes. And so uh, people need to Face this. It's a real. I, I have a lot of people too. 
when I talk about white racist imperialism, like that is a thing for generations. They made no secret of it that the white people were superior to everyone else. And that's what gave them a right to go into someone else's country and take everything that they have. And that is still the mentality to this day. And this isn't some, you know, I, I, I've heard, had people accuse me of spreading cultural Marxism. I don't even know what that is, first of all. <laughs> it's a fact of history that- We don't like labels, you and I, we don't like countries. labels. Yeah. We don't like well, those. Yeah. Want, once they put this label, oh, he's a Marxist. Uh, you know, it's like, no, we are not boxes. You know, we are more complex than that. Come on, get out, get out of this boxes thing, you know, it, or Marxist, and you need to stick to that. No, no, it's not like yeah. that. But there can I a... point out just one thing? You know, like yeah. just when it comes to Russia and China, you're right. When it comes to, uh, a good example is Tucker Carlson, Mersheimer. Actually, ultimately, they are anti-Chinese. What happens is that some of them, uh, you have the Democrats, they're more like, oh, you know what? There's a anti-Russia and anti-China. While you have sometimes, you know, like the conservatives, they, they, you know, they, they'd rather have actually Russia on their side, not to hit too much on China, on Russia, so you can actually focus on China. But you see, ultimately, the end is China. It's whether, oh, you fight Russia and China simultaneously, or you, you, you know, or you, you focus only on China. Ultimately, this is, this is what they do. So this is why, you know, when you look at Mersheimer, Mersheimer is really good on Ukraine. He's absolutely right. But you know what? Yeah. What is his purpose here? Is that he knows that for the collective West, it would be much better to have Russia on the side of the West and then fight China. Yeah. That's how they see it. That's how they yeah. see it. Because yeah. the ultimate piece is China. Russia, Russia, of course, is strong. It's an obstacle to the globalist agenda. But the ultimate piece is China. And it's been like this. I remember you mentioned, you know, like uh, the Pentagon paper in the 60s. I mean, in the 60s, the U.S. was already plan planning an encirclement of China already in the 60s. Yeah. Nothing new. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, we're at the one hour mark. I see a lot of really great questions. I, you know, um, maybe what we got to do next time, Angelo, is just kind of reserve the last 15 or maybe yeah. even... Yeah, 15 minutes, I guess. The last 15 minutes just just to questions, even though I will, if I see a really good relevant question while we're talking about something, I'll throw that up on the, the screen also. Uh, thank you, Angelo, for taking time to join us today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, everyone who has tuned in. Again, check the video description for where you can find my work and Angelo's work, especially elsewhere off of YouTube in case my channel gets deleted. All of my videos are automatically backed up to Odyssey and Rumble. And if I ever disappear off of YouTube, I will be uploading straight to those platforms. I'm also on Telegram because I've been deleted off of uh, Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> so go to Telegram. I update that a couple of times a day. So I usually do three videos a week. But in between, every single day, I update Telegram. Angelo, you're putting out a lot of comment uh, content. You're on Twitter. You have a YouTube channel. You've been putting out videos there. Uh, so uh, please check. And I'll, I'll, I'll pin this in the comment. Uh, you know, I'll pin a comment in the comment section after this is done uh, so people can follow, uh, follow uh, Angelo's work and my own work off of YouTube. Uh, very important to have backups because uh, uh, Jackson Hinkle, I, I don't know what his status is, but he's either off of YouTube or very close. Um, uh, Alex from the Duran also has been banned for a week, but who knows? It could, could end up permanent. So we, we all got to be careful and we got to find alternatives. Uh, uh, again, thank you everyone. And until next time, bye for now.